Hey everyone, this is Ross Ratty, and uh, welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, and how to use all that stuff in the kitchen, and also how to grow it. Uh, that's the most important thing, right? We want to be growing as tasty of food as possible. That's my life goal. Um, in this episode, we're going to be talking about my fig season, my 2019 fig season. About two weeks ago, we touched on the fig season quite a bit, and I directed you guys to a post that I had made on rfigs.com. There's also a post that I will be making soon on the blog, which will include all of this, and you guys can go on figboss.com, where all of this information will be available to you guys, and you can read it at your leisure. Um, so figboss.com. Also, go down to the bottom of the, the blog and sign up for notifications. You'll be notified by email just when we make a new blog post. Nothing more than that. Um, so we made a new post today, actually, and we really went through crazy detail of detailing out not only the photo album for 2019 of just the many, many varieties and many figs that I ate this year, we have our ripening dates for everybody to see, um, showing you guys, you know, if the tree is in a pot, if the tree is in the ground, when the bud break, uh, when the tree broke bud, and then also when it ripened its first main crop. I would have really liked to have gotten the last main crop date as well, but I just could not keep track of certain things that I really wanted to this year. I just ran out of time. I was really in study mode for the CPA exam, but um, certainly uh, this information can be of use uh, for a lot of people. Also, I have a list here of my current keeper list. These are varieties that I've pretty much have on a pedestal above all others for now. I think there's a lot more that can be added to this list. We have a whole list of varieties with a thick and dense texture. We have some uh, a list, um, another list. We have many lists that we put out for people to hopefully add to. I really want people to uh, put in their input and add on to these lists. But another list of varieties that have drying capabilities here, um, or at the very least, will shrivel up on the tree. And uh, we also have a list of varieties with an elegant berry flavor. We have a list of varieties with unique or uncommon characteristics, particularly in terms of their flavor, different flavor categories. In fact, if I show you guys the the spreadsheet that we have, which is in the, by the way, the, the link to this spreadsheet is in uh, the description of every video I've ever put out, but this has the flavor categories, the flavor uh, categories of figs that we've pretty much narrowed down into many different categories that you can place some of these figs into and this I think really helps people get an understanding of what these figs taste like and this year of course we've learned more we've separated these categories out even further and um, I just really like the way that it's kind of turned what it's turned into it's still not finished but we put a lot of work into that as well today uh, we also put in a list of varieties that have special growing requirements here in my climate uh, and then we also have at the very bottom the coal list, the varieties that I'm going to be getting rid of. And um, this is just a crap ton of information in one little post. Um, you know, the, the video we did two weeks ago featuring the first post that I made and, and really talking about the techniques that I, I did uh, this year and the techniques that I've learned and the techniques that I'm going to be growing, going forward with, that was somehow pretty quick. Uh, and even talking about very specific varieties that we talked about. This I think I could go on for what seems like forever about. Uh, I could make like six videos just on this, uh, this post alone. Um, so I guess we could start out with the photo album. And if you guys go to the link in the, um, in the post here, in the blog post, but also either on our figs or on, on Fig Boss, you'll see the link here. And it really details out every single fig that we, not every single fig, but for the most part, the first fig of many varieties. Um, and then we detailed this out or 
really interesting moments or interesting varieties that I decided to capture. And I think I'll go over this in a separate video completely. Um, but it just goes to show if you go through all this and you scroll through all this, you can also see, by the way, on the side, the, the right hand side here, the info tab, it'll show you the variety name. So it won't just leave you guys in the dark on knowing what these things are. But uh, it really goes to show the beginning of my season to the end of the season, and it's in order. So you get to see the quality and kind of what things look like, the really poor quality here at this time of the year, which is if this shows up, um, this is a July 31st. The quality really wasn't that great. Um, and then we go into August, and we're getting some decent quality, still nothing amazing. We finally get some pretty good quality here with LSU Red. Um, and also LSU Scott's Black. And it's just as interesting, I think, and really a testament to the amount of, to the quality that I was able to achieve this year and the amount of figs that I was able to ripen this year. Of course, this isn't every fig, unfortunately. Um, this one I thought was Blavetta Campos, but in actuality, this is De La Gloria, I believe. And I need to change... Um, that in the spreadsheet. This one really blew me away, Paradiso from Ciro, and this will kind of give you the, the real proof in the pudding as to what is good and what's not. You know, you can really easily look at these photos and say, well, this was an incredible fig uh, just by looking at it, you know? Um, and we try to label these, as many of these as we can. Azores Dark, here we have some that are drying up on the tree. Just incredible. There's Naruchiola de Elba, both of them insanely good figs, especially at that time of the year. Uh, it was something. Here's Black Portuguese. Not sure why this isn't labeled here. Uh, from Belle Claire Nursery. They had their own Black Madeira type. This is an LSU Purple. Wonderful, wonderful fig. Um, underrated. I don't know. People have weird taste buds if you ask me. It's a great fig. It's got an interesting spice flavor to it that I think people could easily be turned off on. I get it. I get it. But it's still really good. Here's the two Paradiso side by side, Ciro. And um, for some reason, the description of these varieties is not showing up, which is really sad because now you're not able to see all of the variety names. Very strange. Here at this point of the season, August 31st was the epitome of the quality this year, which is very strange to get the highest quality actually in late August. Um, normally the highest quality would be like the very beginning of August, late July, but I had very dry weather at this time and I had, I had my watering, my moisture, my soil moisture under control at this point. And that was the key. It took me a while to really get that a hold of all that. But once I did, I achieved the highest quality I've ever have with these with these figs right here. Really, really something special. And then unfortunately from this point onwards, we just get progressively worse. You can but you can see the production really ramps up here. And just look how many like the sheer number of fruits that I've been eating. Um at the end of August onwards is kind of scary. I was getting easily a plate of figs every day. It's just really high, crazy numbers. I couldn't keep up with it. I couldn't eat them all. I ended up drying a few, really letting a lot of friends try some of these and taste them themselves and, you know, see for themselves what these things are about. And, you know, this year I don't have as many people close to me eating them. Um, so I, I really have some excess this year. LSU Tiger, uh, just an incredible fig, guys. Capulcar Negra, also really tasty. And then the the quality kind of just gets worse when you get into. Fortunately, this was uh, the quality was still really good here, even though the temperatures cooled down, and you can see that there's a lot of cracking on this day. That's because the, the temperatures really cooled down and there was a big temperature swing 
which caused the cracking in these figs. Um, this was an incredible malt of black, and it just goes to show, even throughout September, which normally would be pretty rainy, we had a a bit of a bit of a bit of rain in early September. But after that little rain event, it was pretty much dry for pretty much all of September, and the quality was quite good. Um, of course, I couldn't ripen some figs as well as I wanted because of SWD. We're still getting at the end of September high quality fruit. This was an incredible variety here for Dino del Nord. And it just kind of goes on and on, even getting dried figs in late September. Um, here's a De La Roca that was pretty much dried up on the tree and Moro de Caneva, which really is an impressive variety. Um, just, it really was an incredible season. This kind of just lays it out right here for everybody to see. So that's the nice little photo album. I think I'll go through this a little bit more carefully in a separate video for you guys if you're interested on YouTube. Um, the ripening order, unfortunately, I mean, this is going to help some people, but unfortunately, I think a lot of these varieties don't really give you the most accurate representation of when these varieties will actually ripen. And that's a bit of a shame, you know, because you gather all this data and people like this kind of thing. Um, but in reality, I would say even half of these maybe are just not accurate into what they really will be. And I have a lot of trees that, you know, didn't really perform nearly as well as they should have or will in the future. Yet we still got ripe figs off of them. And it's like, all right, well, I want to keep track of this date. I want people to know, but you know, it's kind of one of those things where you just have to sit here and be like, just use this at your own, your own peril, I guess. Um, even things like Azores Dark, which unfortunately are still very young, the mother tree we planted in the ground, and it it was the very last tree for the most part to wake up in the ground. It did still fruit, but and actually by a reasonable time. But still, nothing, uh, nothing really that great. Um, and actually, maybe it sounds a bit early. It sounds actually very early. Um, oh no, no, I had a La Magdalene that ripened August twelfth. So that, yeah, that's that's about right. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm also gonna probably get rid of some of these figs. You know, you finally get to try them and you realize that these are just not the fig that you want. I'll, they may have a great flavor and they may do something you want, but because they ripen so late, some of these, like, you know, this is a good example right here, Barbera Bronca. Anything ripening after September 1st is really just not a fig you want in this climate. And yeah, like Bordesote Rosa, I don't expect this to be the, the case every year. I don't expect it to be ripening October 10th, you know, um, these trees will get their act together. They will mature. They will have better seasons, especially now that we're not, we have the right pruning techniques. I think that was really hurting us for years. Um, but there are figs like, let's say, Sindrosa, which still has 80 to 90% of the crop on it to this day, being that it's October 17th. Um, so, you know, even though the first one here ripened over a month ago, it still has 80 to 90% of the crop on the tree. And in a normal season where there wasn't so much rain, it would be like the worst, or in a normal season where there is more rain, it would be one of the worst varieties by far. Uh, absolutely by far. You know, you really get to understand because some of these are ripening so late, even though some of them may not be the most accurate description of when they should ripen. Uh, we had a few issues this year, but it still goes to show like anything that's ripening after September 1st is a bonus in my mind. Um, this was a great, fantastic year. We got spoiled here in the Northeast. This is a freak year. This isn't going to happen. This is maybe one out of every five, maybe one out of every 10 years. 
and we just got to enjoy it when we can get it. Um, so then I have a keepers list here, and I think this is pretty important to talk about. Um, to make this list, they must be extremely rain resistant and highly flavorful um, with a, a low to medium in duration hang time. Hang time is pretty important to me, especially in this climate. And some of these I don't know the hang time exactly just yet. Um, things like Calderona and some of these I just don't have. I don't even possess them. I haven't acquired them. But they're on the keepers list because I have heard so many good things about some of these from people in similar climates. And from what I've read, it just makes a whole lot of sense to have them on this list. It just I, I can't imagine them not being something that makes the cut. Um, and the keepers list is like the list down the road when everything's said and done, when I have varieties that I need to get rid of and I need to limit, really limit the number of varieties I have, this is the list of varieties that I will keep. Everything else I have is really just an experiment at this point. It's always been an experiment. So if it's not on this list, I don't recommend it. Yeah, I do have some figs on that are not on this list that could make the list and should make the list, but we don't have the exact proof yet. We don't have uh, too much information to even add them prematurely to the list before I've even examined it for myself. And of course, this list can even dwindle further, and it should dwindle further because there's about 40-some varieties on here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Yeah, so there's about forty-one. I think that's what I counted prior. There's about forty-one varieties on here. What's it, what is interesting though is how I've broken them down, and that the very late varieties. I only want five percent of my collection to be very late. So if I have a hundred potted trees, which I think a reasonable number of potted trees is probably for me somewhere around 50 to 75 I think is I think is reasonable maybe 50 is probably the the uh, the real number there but um, so if I had 5% of that of 50 only two and a half potted trees can be very late so I would have one Black Madeira and one De La Senora Hivernenka. And that's kind of the way it looks right now. Um, and then mid to late varieties, 35% of that would be mid to late. 60% of them would be early varieties. And I've already made many copies of things like Azores Dark and Smith. Um, I'm trying to get more copies of Aishia Black. I have copies of Blanche de Du Cezanne, Borges Soak Grease. So I may have this kind of out of whack at this point. I may have more mid to late varieties than anything else at this current moment. But inevitably and eventually this is gonna have to change and shift to what I really want. Um, so it's gonna just gonna have to be more of these early varieties. And that's where Campaneri comes in and these different Celeste types and Azores Dark and um, even the Pastelliers that we have many copies of and Ron de Bordeaux we have many copies of. You know, I do think Ronde Bardot is a solid, solid fig, but by no means is it, you know, as tasty as, let's say, Azores Dark or Campaneri. But it is worth, well worth having many copies of, I think. Um, and it just maybe might go to show that if the both of these, Azores Dark and Campaneri, are, let's say, you know, have that superior quality to it and ripen almost as early or, or maybe even earlier, then what's the point of Ronde Bordeaux? There won't be. And at that point, I can eliminate Ronde Bordeaux, which would be a crazy thought. It would be an absolutely crazy thought. But um, I actually can see that happening. Um, very much so. We'll see. I want to have some Ronde Bordeaux. I'm going to keep Ronde Bordeaux around for at least three years. You know, and we'll get to see if uh, you know it can do anything different. And of course, I'm probably not going to rip my tree out of the ground and, um, you know, we'll see about that whole thing. But 
Some of the most impressive varieties on this list, though, uh, let's see, of this year were Neruccio de Elba, Verdino del Nord, and Sucret. Um, I think those were the most impressive this year. And also, I was really impressed by Borges Soak Reese and, and Violet Sapor um, and De La Roca. I think De La Roca uh, has the potential to just completely replace Cold Adam for me. Um, also, I was really impressed by Moro de Caneva and LSU Tiger. I mean, I, I was really impressed by quite a few, if I'm being honest. <laughs> um, they, they're not, you know, if they're on this list, they're an impressive variety. Um, I do have some, like I would say RDB, you know, Ronde Bordeaux and Long de Dut that I think are the classic, and even Violet de Bordeaux, they're like the classic standard figs that you'd be crazy to get rid of, and you should have many copies of, but I can honestly see a future in which they get replaced, which is kind of kind of nuts um, to think about. So I guess moving on here, um, you know, I could talk about this quite a bit. I could go into, into detail about every single variety if I really wanted to and talk about why I think they're all really fantastic. Um, you know, maybe I should, let's see here. So the list of varieties that have a thick and dense texture, that's the next category. You know, these are all just really thick and dense and jammy figs that, and the reason why I'm listing this out is because these are the best fig, these are the figs with the best texture. And therefore are going to have almost, in most situations, they're going to be the best flavor. Yeah, flavor and texture are different things, and I would definitely separate them and say that, all right, well, Black Madeira has the best flavor, but it doesn't have the best texture, you know? And that's where something like Col de Dom and De La Roca come in, and they just destroy Black Madeira because they have that perfect texture to them. And um, that's always what I've been trying to do really since last year when I ripened one of my first really well ripened Col de Dom Blancs and by how bl like blown away I was by that fig um, I just ha I just said to myself I have to have this fig I have to grow this fig every single year I have to I have to find a replacement because the Col de Doms are a bit finicky and I'm always trying to look for something that's maybe a bit earlier that fills the same gap, the same category. And these are the ones that seem to be the figs that fit that thick and dense texture. They're not all, of course, at that level of the Col de Doms. But this is why I think it's really important to show you guys this list here because these are the ones that are the among the best and have the potential for me personally to even make it in the long run in terms of flavor, right? Now we have a list of varieties that have the ability to dry here. And this is also extremely, extremely important because when you have a fig that can dry well on the tree, it almost always really, it's really rain resistant. Um, there are some of them though, which is very strange that even though they're, uh, they're rain resistant, they're not split resistant. Even though they can dry on the tree, some of them for some reason are not split resistant. Like um, this first fig here, Marseillais. Marseille, Marseille, I don't even know how to pronounce this guys. It's a French fig, it's small, it dries on the tree really well. Um, also I find that Grise de Saint Jean can split a little bit. Um, Suwadi's got a big eye. You know, so some of these, I think the sugar content within them is just, it's just enough to get it there. It doesn't have the cracking in the skin. It's rain resistant. And the combination of those three, it really gets it to that point where they can shrivel on the tree and not spoil, not to, not ferment, which is just a fantastic, like I said, a fantastic characteristic to have here. That's literally the epitome of uh, of a fig that I'm looking for. People ask me, what are the kind of figs I'm looking for? This is really the big thing. 
that they can dry. They have this dense and jammy texture. And when they dry up on the tree, a lot of them have that dense and jammy texture. You know, maybe not as dense or cakey as Col de Dom, but they've got a great flavor to them. And then, you know, the, the next category here is a list of varieties with an elegant berry flavor. And this is quite different. Um, this is probably my the best flavor that my figs will have. You know, there's the texture, there's the flavor. Um, you know, there's also the when they dry up on the tree, they lose a lot of that water content. They really intensify the flavor. But in terms of flavor, when we're talking about flavor alone, the best figs are the elegant berry flavors. And people have described these in so many different ways, like exotic, they've called them in the past. Um, I, I can't remember what I used to call them. I used to have a weird, oh, um, no, nah, I don't remember what I called them before. But the way I, I, I think of these when I eat them is that it's such an elegant flavor. Like it's, it's complex. I'm not gonna lie to you, but there's something else there that makes it more like this is like the, the fruit of a king, you know what I mean? Like you're eating something that's just real special, just above the rest. And for me, that's like, that's the key. You know, that's what I'm looking for. And it, it's pretty easily described when you eat a, a black Madeira. If you ever eaten a black Madeira, it ha and a well-ripened black Madeira, it has that flavor. It has that elegant berry flavor. And I've found that flavor in other figs, maybe to less a less degree. You know, black Madeira is the king of this, just like the cold and alms are the king of the dense and jammy figs. The black Madeira is the king of the elegant berry figs. And I've, I've just put together a list of figs that I've tried here that really blowed me away. And if you were to, I think, in a nutshell, if you were to just combine, if you were to, if if uh, if there was a fig that met all three of these categories here, so that they can they have a the right texture, they have the right flavor, and they have the ability to dry, that's the perfect fig for my climate. That's the best one, and I think the only fig that does that is actually the hardy Chicago types. Um, so Malta Black, Azores Dark, um, I think those are the only ones that do it for me. Oh, and, and I think De La Roca is another one. Um, maybe Verdino del Nord, yeah. So Verdino del Nord is another one. So Verdino del Nord, we have De La Roca, we have the Hardy Chicago types. And I have a feeling Campaneri is also going to be on that list. So there's four of them right there. Yep, Campaneri's on that as well. And there's a fig that I'm gonna get um, that I haven't fruited yet, I haven't had much experience with it, but it's called Reculver. And I have a feeling it's gonna be in all three of these categories. But we just named four of them. Campaneri, the Hardy Chicago types, De La Roca, and Verdino del Nord. Those are the four best figs I have. Just based off of what, I, based off of these three categories of everything I'm looking for, disregarding earliness, you know, because De La Roca is pretty late. Those are the best figs I have. In fact, I'm going to write that down. That's a really good thought right there. That's. You know that's a game changer right there when you got a, a huge collection and you're obsessed and you're like oh well I don't know what to get rid of well this puts it really in perspective three categories party Chicago Campaneri Roca De La Roca and Verdino del Nord and I would even, I would even kind of, I want to add Nerucciolo de Elba to this. 
but I don't think I can because this doesn't have as dense of a texture to it, but it doesn't necessarily really need it because it's such a small fig that it's like eating a fig berry is that is how I like to put it. I think I'm going to add a ritual to elbow because it, it really, a fig that small will never have, well, even though Verdino del Nord does. Anyway, that's my top five right there, I guess. That's kind of crazy to think about. All right. Um, yeah, really puts it in perspective right there. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, list of varieties with unique or uncommon characteristics, mostly in involving their flavor um, or the texture here. Uh, and if we go into the you know categories here, the flavor groups that we're going to update and change and hopefully make this perfect at one day. I mean, it changes every year, unfortunately. But these figs here, uh, the categories we added and the, the unique categories, it seems like, that, that exist. Fruity honey, that's certainly one of them. Uh, you know, things like Albo, LSU Huye, and Bibera Branca, they ha are honey figs essentially with a fruity berry flavor to them. It's really an interesting, awesome combo that's well above your standard honey fig. And another honey fig that I grow is called Zephyro, but it's also well above the others in that it's actually citrusy. It's like the most complex flavored honey fig I have. Um, some other ones that I have that are really interesting that I would kind of close, I would almost say that they are honey figs, but definitely Sweet Joy. Sweet Joy is a honey fig. And there's two others, Daloso and LSU Purple, that are not necessarily honey figs, but they have this interesting spiciness to them on the skin. Sweet Joy is probably, in terms of the uniqueness of the flavor, it is the most unique fig I have. It even has a very unique texture. The entire thing is extremely unique. Sweet Joy is the most unique fig. Now, it has other things about it that I, I don't really love or I'm not really in love with, but in terms of a different fig, that is like the number one for me. We even have some peachy and tropical figs that I would say Yellow Nietzsche's is. Uh, I have some figs that I don't like that have a fruity twang to them, kind of like an acidic fruitiness. That's GM175, Spey, and Red Libya. Again, it's they're unique. Um, I had a, a, a fig this year, Black Portuguese from Belle Claire Nursery. That honestly tasted like a table grape. It was a very obvious table grape flavor. Um, I have some this year that had a very creamy texture. I was surprised by how creamy they were. Bial and White Marseille. Some have bitter skin, unfortunately, and that's also White Marseille and the Ruchola de Alba. I have some that have very uh, subtle, unfortunately it's only subtle, but the Concord grape flavor of LSU Tiger and Azores Dark is really something special. Um, I also have figs that taste like cherry candy. This is very obvious, the cherry candy one. Hated the Argentile, Cavalier, Cavaliere, and uh, Rubato, all of them have that cherry flavor. It's insane. It's actually insane. Um, so yeah, those are all the varieties, guys, that have some unique characteristic to them. I also have uh, varieties I put together in a list here that uh, have special growing requirements. And, you know, I personally think that every single one of my figs should be grafted. Um, it's definitely the way to be with all this. Um, they just do so much better. Uh, most of them grafted, you know, because they all have different root systems. They all have different needs. They all grow at different vig different rates. Um, you know, and the differences between the varieties will be a lot more apparent if you had them all in the same rootstock. <laughs> because a lot of the issues and differences that you may see in some of these trees really are not that big of an issue. Um if you had them on a, a strong rootstock and healthy and vigorous rootstock. So I personally think that if you just put them all in the same thing, it would, it would streamline the varietal differences and make them more accurate. 
um, you know, here's some examples. So like hated the Argentile, when it's on its own roots, it's very difficult to establish. It has a very weak root system. And when you graft it, the fig changes dramatically. The size of the fruit changes, how early it is changes, um, how many fruits it produces changes. Everything about the fig is so much better that it doesn't make sense to me to not have it grafted. Um, same thing with Grease de St. Jean. It just needs a lot of food. It's difficult to establish. You know, it has a weaker root system for sure. And it doesn't like too much soil moisture. So if you guys can, you know, really get uh, these things grafted, it really makes a big difference. Moscatel Preto, I don't know if it needs to be grafted just yet but it does need to be in the greenhouse because I want it to be earlier than it was this year and last year um, because it just seems to be a bit more watered down if, uh, if it's rainy outside. And getting it earlier, I'm gonna increase my chances of, of having a, a drier climate. Um, the Col de Doms are very heavy feeders and I think they will respond so much better on a, a vigorous rootstock. Planera is the same thing. It needs to be green, given a greenhouse head start. It's a wonderful fruit. You know, it's a mid-season fig. It's not too late, but without a doubt, it should be given a, a, a head start. Aishia Black and Mid Black Madeira, both from UC Davis, they're very difficult to get established and they, they should be grafted onto something vigorous. Uh, Pastelier in this situation, I think there's a lot of chance, and the same thing with, with Celeste and Blue Celeste. I think the both of them, if you graft them, they'll be less likely to drop fruit and to reach maturity quicker. I think these fruits on their own roots, these varieties on their own roots, just take a lot longer to mature, unfortunately. So onto the coal list, this is a really long one here. And I'm thinking about maybe doing this as a part two. I think we should go over the coal list on its own. Let me talk to you guys a little bit about some of the keepers here before I let you guys go. So the keepers, uh, Azores Dark, like I said, it, it met all the three categories that I talked about below. Black Celeste and Blue Celeste, these are two Celeste heirlooms that uh, really have great flavor, great rain resistance, they're quite early, and they're well adapted to, uh, to a humid climate. You know, They should be among the best in the early season category. Campanieri, it's got everything guys, even crazy hardiness. Uh, Figu Jean, this is one I haven't tried yet. My tree unfortunately didn't get off to the best start. And even the one I had in a pot didn't get off to the best start. We'll see what I'm going to do with this. And I'm, I'm sure I'll get fruit next year because it, it's, it's fruiting right now um, after it finally got its act together. But uh, Figu Jean is uh, as early as Rondé Bordeaux. It's earlier than Rondé Bordeaux. And it looks like a very tasty fig. LDA is standard. Rondé Bordeaux is standard. Pastillier. Um, I'm still waiting for it to mature a bit before I can honestly say it's in my top five, but it's got great qualities to it. Hardiness, I think it's rain resistant. I think it can dry up on the tree in drier weather here. Um, it's it's very early. I think I may have said that. It's, it's quite tasty. Um, it's just an overall fantastic variety. LSU Huye and Albo, they fit that really awesome fruity honey category that I love. They're both quite early. Both seem to be reasonably rain resistant, um, but I'm not entirely sure on that just yet. LSU Tiger, man. This is a fig that just takes a long time to mature. Impressive flavor, as we talked about. It's early. It's rain resistant. Um, it's beautiful, too. Moro de Caneva. It's very early. Um, it can dry up on the tree. The flavor is like eating a Villette de Bordeaux, but better. 
In fact, I'm so... I'm almost convinced that Moro de Caneva is better than Avila de Bordeaux in almost every way, um, yet being very similar to Avila de Bordeaux. So I'm hoping next year I can actually eliminate Avila de Bordeaux. That would be crazy. Uh, Vertolino is one that is also another very early fig. Doesn't get talked about a whole lot. Very small, but it has a great flavor to it. It's dense and jammy. Wonderful fig. Smith, pff, I mean, this is the, the best fig I have or had last year. I think there's figs now that beat it um, by my standards. I think it's been dethroned as the king. Um, Zafiro, we've, ta we've touched on. It's got a great flavor, uh, flavor to it for a honey fig. It also just does well. Like it's very rain resistant. It seems reasonably early. Um, maybe I could say one day that it is early, but for right now, I would classify it as mid season. Uh, Negra de Agde. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce that. This is a fig I've yet to try, but it has that Col de Dom esque density to it, and it's not late. It's very tasty, um, and it should be quite rain resistant as well. Sucret, uh, just incredible mid-season variety that can dry up on the tree. I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure it's the same thing as Col Noir. Great flavor. Uh, everything about it is wonderful. Neruchilla de Elba, they're eating, it's like eating a fig berry, guys. You just, uh, you legitimately are in heaven, basically. Um, one little bite is one fig, but that one bite packs a punch, man. It is a, it's incredible. And the same thing with Verdino del Nord. It's small. You eat it in one bite. It's the, the green fig berry. Both of them dry up on the tree really well. Actually, better than any fig I have. The both of them dry up on the tree so well um that it, it even happens like on day six of their ripening stage day six or day seven that they'll become uh shriveled up on the tree hated the argentile i like this fig for many reasons but actually the flavor i'm not that big of a fan of the the cherry flavor profile the cherry candiness i could honestly do without however to fit that category, it's so unique, and it does the best out of the figs that I have in that category. The Daloso, it's uniquely flavored, early, rain resistant, Planera. It should be very dense, like the Col de Doms, and um, you know, it splits, it's mid season, very tasty. Uh, Black Greek. Violet Sapor, Socorro Black, Borgeso Gris. I kind of think of them all in the same way, and some people have even said the said that they're the same, and they look the same, and they taste the same, and I still am really on the fence of the whole thing, but they're all very good, mid-season-ish, mid to late season, very productive, very tasty, rain-resistant. They're great figs. Dell's Hermitons, this is a new one. It's more on the later side of mid to late. Um, it's got that black Madeira flavor. It's actually really incredible, that fig. Very happy to have it. Colonel Littmans, this is, I think, going to be the black Madeira replacement in the future. And you can kind of put I-258 in here somewhere. But for the meantime, I don't want to add in Italian 258 because I think Colonel Lippmann's is going to be the, the one that replaces them all because it is the most split resistant, the most rain resistant um, black Madeira type. And it's also quite early um, in, in terms of as far as black Madeira goes. Um, I see a black from UC Davis. I'm excited for this as well as Aishia Black from the Pork Rolls Conservatory in France. Finding out if they're the same, if they're different. 
the both of them look like incredible fruits. They should be incredible. I would imagine they could be in the top five of my collection. Uh, rain resistant, mid season, great flavor. Blanche de du Cezanne, very dense and jammy flavor, um, texture. Quite a good flavor. And, um, you know, this year it definitely ripened uh, on the later side, but uh, we chopped our tree all the way back to the base. And honestly, you can't really expect to get anything or really the greatest production or timing out of a tree you plant in the ground and chop all the way down to the base. Uh, Izmir not. This one I'm still on the fence on, believe it or not. But I think it impressed me so much last year that it, it's it's making me hard pressed not to keep it on this list because this year wasn't the greatest. A couple things went wrong that were my own, my own fault. We'll have more of them that are going to ripen up in the next couple weeks and maybe that my opinion of them will will be reinstated. But I'm not entirely sure just yet. La Bourgeoisie, this is one that I don't I don't have currently. And I'll have to say that uh, everything that I've read and people have said about it and the way it looks, it's going to be a winner here, no doubt. It's got that cold and um, density to it. It's earlier. It's more like a mid-season fig. Very tasty. Rain resistant. Calderona's in the similar boat in that it should be rain resistant. Um, I think it's reasonably split resistant, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's very productive. It's not too late. It's more like somewhere in between mid and late. Um, and again, very tasty. White Madeira number one. I kind of classify this similarly to the Blanche de Du Cezanne. I don't know why. I would venture to guess they could even be the same fig. Um, because everything I've heard about white Madeira number one, I've yet to try one for my own tree. But everything I've heard, it sounds a lot like Blanche de Du Cezanne. Sounds pretty damn similar. Del San Um I have really high expectations for that fig. Fantastic flavor. It doesn't seem too late in the season. Great rain resistance. Pretty good split resistance. Um, the texture and the the elegance of the berry flavor is off the charts. Socorro Black, um, we talked about that. Col de Don Blanc, I mean, do we even need to say anything, right? It's kind of just like Black Madeira. De La Roca, this I think, again, is like the replacement for Col de Don Blanc. It dries really well, very easily. This one's in the top five, as you know, as I just sort of figured out in this video. Um, De La Senora Hivernenka, this is also incredible, but seems to be quite late, a lot like Black Madeira. Short hang time, which I really love, and it should be quite rain resistant, which is a big plus. So that's kind of the episode here, guys. I think I'll come, in to you guys, come at you guys maybe again with some more things on this particular topic. We have more posts down here. <laughs> we talked about so much in this episode, and there's going to be so much more to even talk about, like flavor ratings and a list of uh, precocious varieties, a list of varieties that are too vigorous. Um, just incredible information in one place. This took me years of years of information to gather from other people than to experience myself to put it all together in this post these couple posts here the uh, you know even on the blog figboss.com it's just like what it's all here for you guys so I want to thank everybody for watching um, if you enjoyed this one please consider supporting me on patreon definitely appreciate it and we'll talk to you all soon. All right, guys. Um, also, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at Ross Ratty. And we'll see you guys soon, all right? See you for next week's episode. Have a nice, uh, have a nice week, everybody. Take care.